the thing that we were kind of behind tonight really um and i'll just bring up my presentation while i'm um talking to you about this um was well it was twofold really it was um we had an event um some of you again may have joined us for the event um i forget when it was now i think it was probably about a month or so ago um when we were talking a bit about parks and open spaces, but not um, to the same level of detail, when we kind of thought it'd be great to have a follow-up event, um, which we've got tonight, to kind of look at it in a bit more detail. Um, and also, I think um, this kind of, in, in recent years, really a growing awareness um, about the importance of nature in our urban environments, um, the creation of kind of linked infrastructure, green infrastructure, um, kind of the green, the grey to green type exercises um, that we're seeing more and more. And I think kind of the, the lockdown and the COVID pandemic has, has increased that awareness. Certainly, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the press around um, the, the problems of cities, if you like, that have maybe been shown up by the pandemic. And I think, you know, the, the notion that everyone in cities can go out to the country um, has shown to be something that's not going to be realistic. So more more and more it's going to be important for us to bring the city um sorry bring the nature into the city and i think um it's sort of been interesting to see on the news stories um during the lockdown this idea of nature coming into the city of its own accord whether it's you know kangaroos um marching around the cbd in adelaide which was deserted during the lockdown or um flamingos coming in close into the city in Mumbai, um, geese on the seafront um, in, in Turkey, um, and even ducks wandering around the kind of closed and, and desolate streets of Paris during the lockdown. Um, and nearer to home, we, we, we probably would have seen these images of um, the goats taking over in Landudno um, and sheep paying a visit to McDonald's um, in, in Ebervale as well, which we've seen. And I think um, it kind of made me think back really to kind of where did all this begin? And I suppose one of the things in my mind that stimulated a lot of it, and particularly this idea of of more like biodiversity and naturalistic planting, which is one of the things I think we're going to hear a bit about tonight. Um, it's probably the High Line um, and the planting on the High Line um, and that style of planting, um, sort of proponents like Pierre Udolf, who's sort of very well known for his work in this naturalistic planting, which really did bring that kind of idea of nature into the city. Um, for anyone that's been to the High Line, I'm sure many of you um, will have been, if you've been lucky enough to get to New York. Um, you know, I think at the moment, I can't imagine how on earth you could two metres socially distance up there. Um, you know, it was it's absolutely rammed most of the time. So I'd imagine, um, you know, whether that's a, a viable kind of open space going forward, I don't know. Um, and in our own parks, this was um, a couple of days ago in the Olympic Park, you know, remind us to people that they need to be staying two metres apart as they're ex two metres apart as they're using these parks for exercise. Um, and then this kind of image, which I, I saw the other day on the newspaper, which I thought um, actually maybe quite sad. It looks quite, um, you know, quite desolate and, and lonely and urban. And I thought um, if this is what we're going to be seeing for the foreseeable future, um, it would be really nice if we could do something a bit more to bring a bit more nature into um, views like that. So anyway, that's um, that's me done. Um, I'll stop sharing now and I'll hand over to our first speaker, which is going to be Matthew. Thank you. Uh, I'm Matthew Frith. I'm the Director of Conservation for London Wildlife Trust. And um, we were formed in 1981, um, uh, basically at a, a a conference held in in um, Hackney and we had 400 people turn up to learn about the wildlife of London's rubbish tips and the wildlife of the canals and our royal parks at that time um, but it was founded very much on the idea of campaigning to save sites from being built on because there was a fear that we were losing some of the natural spaces that were underappreciated by people at that time and as Paul was saying you know we've got this growing realization of just how important nature is for our well-being and the evidence base for that has been building up considerably over the last few decades but you could argue that the Victorians had that idea very much so when they sort of created the concept of the public park. Now the trust's basis is founded on a map that we, well, we surveyed the whole of London in 1984-85, and those maps have been updated periodically ever since. 
to the point that we have 19% of London, which has got significant areas of wildlife importance. And these are outside people's private gardens. So 19% is of is what we call sinks. 24% of London is um, private gardens, 3.2 million garden plots as a whole. And we have a breadth of habitats in London, which is often underappreciated. So we have ancient hay meadows, we have ancient woodlands, we have heathlands, we have wetlands. We also have those gardens, we have many hundreds of parks, we have housing estates, and we have new green roofs. And London is much more than rats, pigeons, and foxes. Uh, at the moment, we have 15,000 species on the database of plants, animals, and fungi found in London. They're the um, other citizens we share our city with, and we're increasingly becoming more aware about how their needs can be met. Some of those are species which London is actually nationally important for, like black red stars on the top left-hand side there. With, there's fewer than those than golden eagles in Britain. Small blue on the top right is our smallest British butterfly, and we've got sites in London which are in the top four spaces for the whole of, whole of Britain for this particular butterfly. The European eel, which migrates back and forth to Tasso Sea in the Western Atlantic, and the plants in the, four, in the bottom right-hand corner is greater yellow rattle. Again, London has the largest amount of these, this particular plant in the whole of the UK. We have a large number of stag beetles, and currently these are kind of flying around at this time of the year, and, and many thousands of people have been recording those on our behalf. But we are a society which, which is becoming increasingly disconnected from nature. So despite uh, the sort of recent interest of goats coming in San Dardano and sheep in Evervale and the uh, fallow deer that come into the housing estates in, in Harold Hill and Havery, yeah, we have generations of, of people who have become disconnected from the natural world. And this, for me, is an image of something I would like every school children to be able to fearlessly um, uh, take on. That they can, they can, they're proud enough to have a leech crawl over their face. But we're a long way from that. Thirty-three thousand hectares in London is what we call areas of deficiency to high-quality natural habitat from a London context. And we've also been building over our gardens. So this is some work that we did now. 10 years ago, it showed um, 3,000 hectares of London's gardens disappeared over an eight and a half year period, which is equivalent to two and a half high parks going each year. Not only having an impact in terms of biodiversity, but particularly in terms of climate change resilience and our kind of ability as a city to combat that kind of climatic chaos and change, which is, which is becoming, well, becoming much more evident. And Sue may touch on this. I'm taking this from um, the work that's been undertaken in Sheffield here. But what we've seen is a, a massive decrease in what we call children's range behaviour. And this is a, uh, just a sort of image showing over four generations how a great great sorry a great grandfather in 1918, 1919 at the age of eight was allowed to go six miles to go fishing on his own, whereas the son is now only allowed to go to the end of his street. And that is not really anything to do with stranger danger, as the media might suggest, that's to do with cars. So city traffic is the main reason that people have become disconnected from the natural world. And that is basically in by this, this condition now, which um, certainly uh, psychologists and other medical practitioners need to recognize, which is nature deficit disorder which is particularly affecting young people who are not having that contact with the natural world. Now, Paul talked about how we're increasingly doing this. I could say we can go back four or five decades where people have begun to sort of say, argue for nature of the city and trying to put forward the policies and the designs and the solutions to have nature better embedded in the way that we design and manage our city. This is just, a handful of a plethora of guides that have been published over the decades. Today, we're 47% green and blue. Uh, 
one of the greenest cities in Europe in that respect. But it's also a city that we're also, uh, which we're very much aware of, is growing very rapidly. And the current London plan has got this uh, anticipation of having to build 66,000 homes each year by 2041. The question is where are they going to go, what they're going to look like, and how are they not going to impinge on the natural qualities that we, many of us, uh, desperately uh, enjoy and seek to protect. There's been a lot of work in the last four or five years at trying to get a better understanding of the economic value of our natural environment in the city. And these are two studies, just the headline figures there, that are urban forests, so the trees of, of London, whether it's London plains in the centre, right through to the woodlands on the city fringes, contribute about 133 million pounds worth of value to us. And then if we look at uh, the public green spaces in London, they contribute about five billion pounds a year in terms of ecosystem services, whether that's in terms of climate cooling, moisture, surface water, a runoff prevention or slowing down that surface water, as well as the kind of uh, softer social benefits that the natural world gives us. And this, this, this work has looked at, for example, the value of mental health savings and where those could best be prioritised. So this is a lot of work that's been developed by the Greater London Authority. And there's increasingly high quality evidence to show where we can target activity to better improve uh, the city for the people, um, as well as conserve biodiversity, enhance biodiversity in the city as it grows. And we have a background London environment strategy. I won't go into the details of that. This was published two years ago with a number of objectives, which I'm sure we all support. And the way that the London Wildlife Trust is working on this, as many sort of environmental NGOs, is what we call a recovery plan for nature. And that there's a new nature recovery network, which the environment bill going through Parliament at the moment seeking to embed and require local authorities to publish at a local authority level. And the way that we do it is through clustered approaches. So here's an example in, in the London Borough of Hackney, in Manor House, two uh, reservoirs, uh, which we have started to working with Hackney Council, Thames Water, Barclay Homes, um, to open those up for um, public to access but also critically to improve them for biodiversity. And phase one, which is uh, the old state Newington East Reservoir, pictured here, west, which is now called Woodbury Wetlands, was opened by Sir David Attenborough four years ago. Just into the Lee Valley, we have the Walthamstow Wetlands, which is 10 reservoirs in the, right in the middle of the Lee Valley, closed to the public since they were first built, key source of London's water supply. Um, but also internationally important for the birds that they support. Uh, and we've been working with Waltham Forest Council, Thames Water, to transform those into Waltham Stow Wetlands, which is now the, I think it's the largest European urban wetland. Um, and yes, it's quite formal in its kind of structure, but the, the way that we can soften those reservoir edges has begun to change the way that people locally view these, uh, well, most of the people who live locally didn't even know these sites existed, going back to the cause of disconnection. We've continued to work with housing developers uh, because we believe that by working with them at the outset, we can shape the places that they build. And this is an example here, Kidbrook Village in South East London with Barclay Homes, again, building on the work of the London Assembly Plan. And then also, Many, many individuals and organisations have been trying to uh, get habitat into buildings and up onto the top of buildings. And uh, certainly the work of, of, of the Trust um, back in the late 90s was looking for Red Start, I told you about, rarer than the Golden Eagle. It's a bird that a particular type of habitat, um, which is not conducive to being conserved on the ground in central London because it's kind of waste habitat. So we can build those on roofs. In the last 10 years, we've seen 163 hectares of green roofs implemented in London, um, which I think is quite fantastic. 
But it's not just about roofs, because it's arguably we know the technology. I think it's about the more challenging examples and how we change our terrestrial environment. Looking at road space, Paul looked, you know, showed us images of a kangaroo in Adelaide. Um, our roads have become emptier over the last couple of months. And it's interesting how they might look like if we move towards uh, different forms of transport. If we move to communal car sharing, we may need less cars on the roads, desire for more pedestrian and cycle friendly traffic. We can start also changing the places that, like this, this is a road island in uh, Hearn Hill, which we were uh, working with uh, local residents in a bid to try and improve the kind of surface water runoff in this part of London. And another example is known as Wild West End, working with Arup, the Crown Estate, and a number of other, uh, other landlords between um, Regent's Park and St James's Park, how we can green those streets in one of the most densely and busy commercial and retail parts of the West End. We're not the only wildlife trust doing this, and we're not the only other organisation doing this um, in and other cities, so Avon Wildlife Trust and Nottingham Wildlife Trust approaches, one which is kind of looking at community grassroots activities, and Nottingham, which is much more about branding the city and viewing nature in a different way. And this is one of my favourite uh, images from this campaign, which is trying to create a new language for nature in the city, which is embedded with the planning system and the way that our human anthropocentric views of the cities might be altered by looking at them through the views of nature. Finally, I just want to touch on a project that we're working on at the moment. This is on, on, on the fringes, uh, uh, in, on the North Downs, highly important habitat where we're basically creating by bulldozing green deserts to create habitats for rare butterflies like the small blue. Uh, and more importantly, we're bringing this into the housing estates of New Addington um, which is a very large expanse of housing on the fringes of Croydon, but of a ghetto, to be quite honest, disconnected from many parts of its uh, neighbours. And huge amounts of fairly unfunctioning green space. There's even a sign you can't read that says no ball game. So you can't even enjoy playing on this space if you're allowed to. And this is where we can put in habitat for butterflies. And finally, we're not forgetting the very centre of, of, of the city. And we've been involved in the Illuminated River. And I'm talking next week at a, on a webinar about how light can be better improved for biodiversity, such as bats, migrating birds, and migrating fish right in the heart of the city. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Matthew.